Good morning, everyone. Please uh, give us a, a few more moments as people continue to come through. This is a, a very large webinar, so we have a, uh, quite a few people coming through this, this morning or this afternoon. Uh, just give us a few more moments. All right, well, I'm sure that uh, there'll be others that continue to, uh, to join us in the next uh, few moments, but we will get underway. Good morning, everyone. My name's Phil Anderson. I'm the General Manager of Policy and Professionalism at the AFA, uh, and I'm really excited to bring this uh, webinar to you today. This is something that we have talked about for some period of time, is to do a webinar, a joint webinar across the AFA and the FPA on life insurance advice and this is an outcome of our task force our joint task force that's been running for a couple of years and i'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment um, doing something uh, jointly of this nature is is fantastic uh, we get a really big audience but also uh, it's something quite new in my 10 years of being involved with the afa we've never done a joint webinar so it's a it's a first for us and i think it's uh, an exciting Thing for us to be doing. Okay, uh, today we have uh, four panelists. I'm joined by my counterpart, counterpart at the FPA, Ben Martian, uh, and I'm also joined by two excellent risk advisors. Both Catherine and Mark have 15 plus years experience in, in a risk uh, capacity. They've built their own businesses that are risk specialist businesses. Now, I think not only are both Catherine and Mark uh, keen participants in the, in the risk spec, uh, sector, they've also been actively involved in a, a range of committees, including the Joint Task Force, um, but also other committees, and they're both actively involved in life insurance advisory boards. Mark is an experienced speaker and Catherine is an author, and I'm really looking forward to the presentations today. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. There will be one hour CPD available for all participants. And just to clarify, uh, they, those CPD certificates will be uh, accredited by both the AFA and the FPA. So everyone will be certain to be able to access that CPD. Now, Ben is going to look after the questions and answer session, and we will break at a point during uh, at the end of Catherine's discussion to ask questions. And then Ben will come back at the end to do further questions at the end of the presentation. But please put your questions through the Q&A button uh, that's available through Zoom. And that way that will be the, the part that gets focused on by Ben. So uh, yeah, please, uh, please add questions. We look forward to getting your questions. All right, so the session today, we're going to move through the introduction to a quick bit of background on the AFA FPA Joint Task Force on Life Insurance. We'll talk about the origins of that and what, uh, what it has done. We're then going to refer to Mark Everingham to talk about the mind map for risk advice. So Mark will go through that in a little bit of detail. Then we've got Catherine Hayes talking about a case study for individual client, an individual client, uh, and then goes back to Mark, who'll do a business client. And then at the end, Ben will wrap up and we'll go through the Q and A's that we have available. So I'll, I'll jump into it now and talk about the, the joint task force. Now the origins of the joint task force were the Royal Commission recommendation 2.5. Um, if you cast your minds back to 4th of February 2019, when the government released the final report for uh, uh, the Hain Royal Commission, recommendation 2.5 with, with respect to life insurance commissions. Now, there's one positive that we had at that time, and, and some people may not see this, 
but the fact that we already had the lift reforms and the government was committed to the lift review in 2021 meant that the Hain recommendation was not an immediate recommendation to remove commissions as seemed to be his preference, but instead to wait for that lift review to assess the state of the market, look at issues like underinsurance and the quality of, uh, of risk advice. But what it did do is it highlighted very clearly what Haynes' expectation was. And we know very well that if this had have been a direct recommendation, that we would now by now have seen legislation to remove commissions. So having the ability to defer it until the lift review was critical. And I think everyone in the life insurance sector realized that we had to work very hard to ensure that the um, lift review uh, when the final report was released was going to be supportive of the continuation of commissions as one of the options available to clients. So in early 2019, Phil Kuhn and Dante Degori got together and said, well, look, we've, we've got to approach this uh, as a joint initiative across the two associations. And so a decision was made to create a joint task force. Now, this task force has continued to meet on a regular basis over the course of the last two and a half years. And within the terms of reference are issues like uh, how we approach that 2021 ASIC review, how we seek to influence the terms of reference for that review. And that's led to a number of discussions and meetings with ASIC in the meantime. We also added to the um, to the joint task force term of reference, uh, the point about articulating the value of life insurance advice. We also talked about uh, arguing the basis for the retention of commissions as a choice option for consumers. Consumers can choose to pay fees if they wish, but they should also have the option of paying via commissions. And we also thought it was, it was important initiative to try and do what we could jointly to help uh, advisors to make sure that they were going to be doing fine when their files were reviewed as part of the 2021 review. And the life risk guide, which this um, webinar is all about, is one of those initiatives that was put in place with that objective in mind. Now, if I talk about what the task force has achieved, we've done a lot of work um, advocate, advocacy with different stakeholders, regulators, um, other organisations, the government and so on. Um, particularly, uh, we started with FASEA and, and doing advocacy work with them about how the code of ethics might apply uh, to life insurance only clients. Working with APRA on their proposed intervention into the IDII market, which was first announced in uh, late 2019, and, uh, and came into force with the banning of agreed value policies from April of last year. Working uh, with ASIC, um, providing our own input on uh, the methodology that they were using for the LIF review. And this is things like how they selected files, uh, some of the important determinants of the reviews that they've done. I'm um, talking with both ASIC and APRA about emerging concerns in the life insurance market. So in recent years, we've seen very sizable premium increases. We've also been quite vocal about our concerns about discounting practices, those sorts of premium upfront premium discounting practices. These are all things that we've taken the opportunity to advocate on. Also working with the Actuaries Institute in their response to the IDII intervention. And for those who have been looking at some of the new products that have been made available in the IDII market, you'll very much see the, the influence of the Actuaries Institute recommendations in some of those new policies, whether that's the um, income replacement ratios or it's things like uh, own occupation to any occupation after two years. And we've also um, played an active ongoing role in, in meeting with stakeholders, um, putting forward to them an advisor perspective on some of these reforms. Now, equally importantly, both the AFA and the FPA have been involved 
with the work that's been done by the FSC and the life insurers in advocating for choice and access to life insurance, which is the terminology that's been used for the broader campaign around the value of having clients able to choose to pay for their life insurance advice by commissions. The current um, membership of the task force uh, includes the, the president or chair of, of each of the associations, the CEO, um, the head of policy, and then a couple of practitioners from each of the two associations. So you can see there the 10 current members. Um, now, special, special mention of Mark Everingham, who served on the task force for um, well over two years until very recently and has only just stepped off, but Mark has graciously agreed to help us with the presentation today. All right, I just want to uh, end by, by talking in the context of the Life Risk Advice Guide um, that there are some very recent major changes that will ultimately influence the guide. The first one is standard three of the FASEA um, code of, of ethics, which is on conflicts of interest and duty. This has, in our view, long been a problem, um, particularly for risk advice, because there's very few who would argue that commission of some form is a conflict of interest, whether it's which product you choose or how much cover you recommend. There is always going to be factors driven from your recommendations that influence how you'll be remunerated. Now, um, FASEA have then, subsequent to the original release of this standard, reframed it a little bit to provide certain conditions that in their, um, in their guidance they said would permit commissions to be payable. Nonetheless, we think that it is still um, a standard that needs to be fixed so that it works in practice. And the other key point to mention is that uh, one of the codes that advisors are obliged to comply with the TPB's Code of Professional Conduct will no longer be applicable from the 1st of January next year when uh, the Better Advice Bill and the Single Disciplinary Body come in, comes into force and uh, the, the tax financial advice requirements will be captured under the ASIC uh, and the Corporations Act regime uh, and we'll no longer be dealing directly with the TPB on that. There's a little bit of context on the, the joint task force um, composition, what we've been working on uh, over these last two and a half years. Uh, it remains a, an active committee and uh, we will continue to meet and we will continue to pursue options to advocate for life insurance advice and the regulatory regime that applies. Now I'm going to now pass over to Mark Everingham um, to give us a briefing on the risk advice mind map. So over to you, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Phil. Hello, everyone. Um, Phil, it's been a pleasure to work with both associations over the last couple of years, but um, and I'm no doubt the great work will continue going forward. Um, just probably set some context about the, the life risk guide. Uh, I think this mind map sort of sums up the essence of what this document's about. And fundamentally, it starts with the fact that life risk advice is not simple. There is complexity to it that requires expertise uh, by the advisor to consider a range of the client's circumstances when providing advice in this area. And so if you work your way around Around the, the mind map, you know, you're looking at issues of debt, you know, where you place cover inside of outside of super, what is the impact of that as far as erosion of funds go, what cash flow constraints do the client have when considering insurance, you know, how do we as advisors charge our clients for the work that we do, you know, are we a commission only practice, are we a fee for advice practice or are we a combination of the both. Um, what are the future consequences of the work that we're doing for a client? Because uh, we're setting up something not just for today, but for something unplanned that happens in the future. So that might be consideration about uh, step versus level premiums, uh, again, erosion of super uh, and things like that. Um, obviously, with anything we're doing, uh, it comes at a premium cost. So that will have an impact on 
the client's investment and saving capability. Um, you then need to consider, well, what are the estate, non-estate payment of proceeds that a client uh, is trying to achieve in the event of their death or disability? You know, where is the right structure to hold their insurance? What are the right ownership mechanisms? And you'll see how myself and Catherine consider those in our case studies shortly. Obviously, there's tax treatment and consequences of deductibility of premium, um, the tax treatment at the time of claim, depending on the purpose of the insurance. And then once we've considered all those sorts of situations for a client, we then have the you know, understanding of a complex product situation, um, which obviously has only been enhanced recently with the change of income protection. Um, and what are the impacts for clients long term? So, you know, for example, what happens when someone goes from an own to any occupation uh, definition through an income protection claims process? So I just wanted to provide a little bit of context with respect to the guide of saying, look, this is all the things that an advisor needs to put their mind to um, and apply to the individual client situations sitting in front of them. And the reason it's so messy, I guess, is each of these items interplay with each other as you consider, you know, one component to another. So my encouragement to everyone is to sort of use this mind map as a, as a checklist of some of the issues that need to be considered when you're preparing advice for a client. Um, so to put some of this into context, I'm going to hand over to Catherine Hayes now. Catherine will run through um, some of her thoughts about putting together advice for individual clients, um, and then I'll pop back with respect to business clients. Over to you, Catherine. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, yes, so today what I'm really going to do is I'm just going to be focusing on how I apply some of these principles um, in terms of best practice for my service offering. Um, so I'll be touching base on a few of the different elements about the, the guide and what's uh, contained within the guide. And um, just to preface all of this, uh, to speak to my client base, it is largely uh, young professionals, mums and dads, ranging from their mid-20s through to mid-40s. Mid um, and of course, every advisor is going to have their own in-house views, their preferred processes, and just the personal flavour that is simply brought to the experience that you offer your clients. Um, so this best practice life insurance guide, it really is just a resource for anyone who wishes to reflect or review on their processes. So uh, section one of the guide is really touching about the, defining the scope. Um, and there are so many ways that you can, you can do this. Um, obviously, one of the more formal factors is your fact find, um, a specific client direction, whether that's been noted by you know, emails or, um, or potentially using that terms of engagement. Um, being a risk practice, I have used a letter of engagement. So I see that as slightly less formal, which is really just about setting out the client expectations on the costs at each stage, uh, the advice process and other matters of how we handle things such as cancellation and even our hours of availability. Um, and of course, the fact find other documents are useful for um, recording the scope. So what I have done is I've actually shared a copy. I feel we could just jump to the next page. Um, this is just a example of a template of a letter of engagement that I have used to go through with my clients to let them know that what they can expect from the process, noting that we will be putting effort into, uh, you know, researching what they have in place, right through the fees and charges they can um, expect along the way. Um, I do get very good feedback from clients with the use of the letter of engagement, which is used at front, because not only does it cover things like the initial process, it talks about what would happen at claim process, and it can open up conversation pieces in those areas. Um, it covers things like reviews, because some people are of the opinion that you're just there to set up the policy and you disappear after that, because that's what they've heard. So it, it can help alleviate or address some of those misconceptions and set those expectations, because uh, as we know, a lot of the issues come when there is a mismatch of expectation. Um, it also positions us to address things of what happens if a client needs to retain a policy for um, reasons such as avoiding exclusions or loadings um, and how we address that in terms of how would we sort out managing the our time if we're going to manage a claim on a policy that potentially we didn't establish. So it opens up those conversations. Um, so that's just my example there. Um, if we jump to the next page, um, 
this is my version of some something that I have built into my fact find. Um, now, as I said, everyone is going to have their own way of doing things um, because section two of the guide is really all about how do we collect that hard and soft data? Now, I would traditionally use a um, electronic fact find and pre-assessment health questionnaires before a client comes to see me. Um, so I've got a really good understanding of their situation, but this is more my um, soft approach in terms of really educating a client about what it is that they may need to consider. Um, as far as goal setting goes for clients, especially the age group that I deal with, to have someone come in who's specifically asking for insurance advice, when they come in, they just say, look, I just need to know I need cover. I don't know what I've got, but I want to be protected. Um, that's very hard to work with in terms of simply going, okay, I can give you something that will protect you. But what that looks like is going to be very different from each person to the next. Um, and most people aren't aware of all the types of cover being available. For example, trauma insurance, most people don't even, uh, aren't even aware it exists. Um, so to help with ensuring that the, the client is engaged in the process, this is what I use. Um, because drawings, for one, will deepen the understanding. And um, you'll see this diagram I have showing the way covers interrelate. Um, I would often hand draw these, these um, pictures. And I got to the point where most of my clients would take a photo of this diagram because they said it was the first time they understood where the differences were with the cover were and how they interrelated. Um, so noting these areas in each area, it opens up a discussion with the client to talk about what would you want in these range of circumstances? And these are tailored to my own house view. Uh, but I also leave blanks because there is always scenarios where uh, clients add things that you may not expect, or perhaps you have an idea that you want to throw past the client and see what they would like. Um, you'll also notice that I've called it initial desired outcomes um, because this is an opportunity for people to throw out ideas which they may refine and exclude down the track. Um, it's also, I think it's also important when we're talking about risk advice, it's important to educate clients on things such as their preferences. Um, you know, I am a big believer in the whole, you have to keep it simple because complexity can lose a sale, but it is also important to educate your client on aspects such as, you know, uh, why we may potentially consider paying for something out of personal cash flow versus super, what the difference means between an any occupation and an own occupation, and really importantly, especially for my demographic, where usually the only cover they've got is the default cover that might be inside super, to talk about the difference between guaranteed terms and non-guaranteed terms. Um, if you have a client that comes to you and goes, well, why don't we just look at um, some cover through super? We could increase that. And if we've talked about, well, if, are you going to change jobs and change super funds? Will that cover end? Uh, can you take it with you? What if the terms and conditions changes? And when they understand that these factors are in play, often clients go, no, actually, I really don't want to run that risk. The whole reason I want to be protected is to know it's going to be there. So that can then help if you have a scenario where you're replacing, say, um, a group super policy, that's really helping to um, define the basis rather than simply just looking, what is the score? What is the premium? It goes deeper than that. Um, so in short, the methodology is here to help set expectations of what the cover will do for the client, and it's clearly recorded. Um, if we were to jump to the next page. Okay, so once we've got all that information, as we know, this is where the real work starts. We've got all the information from the client. We've got a hard data. We've got a uh, soft data. This is an example of um, a small, small snapshot of a table I've used with a client recently, uh, where I've simply said, following all of those goals, my way of saying to a client is, this is what you've told me is important to you. This is not a recommendation of how much cover you need. It's just, this is what you have told me that are important to you and what you are prepared to rely on, whether it's cash at bank, existing insurance policies, your superannuation um, balance. Have we captured it correctly? Is there anything missing? And most often clients would come back to us and say, um, that's fantastic. I had not actually considered, you know, element X, Y, Z, but now that we're talking through it with the examples you gave me with previous claims, I realized that that would actually be important to me. So it's a part of educating and helping to refine things with the clients. Um, so this is just the piece that ultimately will allow you to then go on and provide that advice. Um, is giving you that opportunity to confirm and refine 
uh, I also use this stage here with a second meeting with a client where I would take the opportunity to saying, look, we've researched your health. We have researched the possible insurances that are available. Um, and we can discuss what indicative terms would be available. Are we expecting exclusions? Are we expecting loadings? Um, what is the ballpark cost likely to be? And uh, so that's when we get to a stage where the client may say, uh, right, I love these outcomes, but at that price, I'm really not quite prepared to pay for it. And then it goes back to the client saying, okay, of these things, what's most important to you? What are you prepared to either retain that risk yourself or forego the outcome completely? Uh, so it really does help us refine that before it goes on to the statement of advice. Um, once again, as far as a compliance aspect and document, you know, if a client was to make a claim later down the track saying they didn't have enough cover, this is a really good way to document to say, hey, you know, we did the analysis, you told us everything that you wanted and you've chosen to scale back. And it just gives more opportunities to document that. Um, if we were to go to the next page, once we've got all of that, obviously it comes down to the recommendation of that product. And as the golden rule, and this is covered by section four in the um, the life risk guide is it really is about knowing your product and knowing your client. That's always been the golden rule. And I just have to say, it really does go beyond the just looking at a you know um, risk software, and it's more than just the the premium competitive and this the score of the insurer rating. Um, once again, um, you know most of my clients, the cover they have is typically only just the default cover that they have within the superannuation fund, fund, and it does need to be taken into account. But if you've built into your process a way of looking at more than just the cover that, uh, more than just the costings, and they understand the features that are important, um, you know, is there a risk of benefits being trapped in super in the event of a claim? Those kind of elements, it can really help you form your basis. Um, I think it's also really important to point out that um, at a roundtable meeting where there was a representative from ASIC, comment was made. Um, by the person at ASIC that they felt that there was no difference between group cover and retail cover in their eyes, other than the commission that the advisor received. So they did not see the justification for that because they were simply looking at it as sums insured and a cost basis. So if you can document discussions around the importance of features such as premium structures, ownership structures, the definitions, the portability, accesses, um, and aspects such as whether the cover is guaranteed or um, these can really help form your basis of the strategy. And you may know this info, you may know that these cover and recommendation is better for the client, but having it documented and having the client understand this also is quite valuable. And if your client understands these key differences, it will help inform their choices rather than looking back going, why did you recommend this rather than the cover that's um, inside super. Okay, if we go on to the next section. Um, I've just included a little extract here about um, section five from the life risk guide, uh, noting this element here about um, discussing the trade-off with the clients in policy coverage, exclusions, excess amounts and premiums and how important that is. Now, I have done this through the process, the strategy paper, what I've done with the clients. So this can be clearly documented both pre-SOA and within the SOA. I was actually quite... Um, Sometimes it's somebody else's legal case, which makes you want to rethink your processes so you don't see that happen to you. And that particular case I saw was an advisor who uh, had made full recommendations to a client and the client had said, look, I don't see the value. I'm going to reduce the sums insured. And that was noted in the authority to proceed. What ended up happening is the client subsequently claimed and that advisor lost a significant amount of time and money and their mental health in terms of battling that claim because an authority to proceed, making that small amendment really isn't, uh, give you, give you su uh, sufficient records to be able to demonstrate the discussions around that. But if you can do that before you prepare the advice, um, I think your client is better, gonna be better informed um, as will your backside in terms of protecting yourself from that side of things. Um, and section five of the guide, it then says, well, what, have, what do you do if the client deviates from your recommendation? What to do? Now, there is a quite a lot that's detailed in the guide that can help you work through that. But I think the key here is that you want to a, address all the objections that you possibly can before you get to that point. Um, in our practice, we have refined that process through the strategy paper 
that when someone says yes to the concepts in the strategy paper, we get a 100% implementation rate on the statement of advice. So we don't have someone coming back going, you know what, I'm going to leave out the trauma insurance or um, some other alteration like that. It is there and documented in the clients on board. They understand the costs and they understand broadly the outcomes they're going to be insured for. Um, okay, so uh, those biggest objections, generally your cost, not understanding what's important or them understanding why. Um, for a perfect case and example, um, when going through the replacement of product advice section on a table, um, we can go through elements such as, you know, uh, I've got a recent case here, I can see some notes in front of me, where we had a client who had about $330,000 worth of uh, life and TPD insurance, which was the default cover through their super fund. And ultimately this client needed about a million dollars worth of life and TPD. Uh, we've gone from they've gone from paying just over three hundred dollars a year in premiums to looking at a rollover of a bit over seventeen hundred dollars. Now that's quite a jump. But going through that, looking at some apples for apples, we said, well, look, if we did use your super fund, we're looking at about you know almost fourteen hundred dollars a year if we were to use your super fund to cover that same outcome. So what we're recommending, despite all of that, is still a few hundred dollars a year more expensive. But the key difference here is. Um, we're using level premiums where, the, where your super fund is using um, stepped premiums. Uh, we then noted down the research and said, you know, dear Mr. and Mrs. Client, uh, look, what we are recommending is more expensive than what you can um, obtain through your super fund. However, by the time you're 60, we've looked at the quotes of what that same cover would cost you at that point based on the current tables. And those premiums are about $16,000 a year. So would you agree that it's worth paying a couple of hundred dollars extra? in order to avoid that situation. Um, and clients uh, are often vehemently agreeing, saying, why would anyone want to do that? Of course, we want to pay an extra couple of hundred dollars if we can avoid that scenario. So I kind of see it like dating in that you don't just want a, a yes, you want an enthusiastic yes to your recommend, recommendations. You want informed consent and you want people to thoroughly agree with you, not just go, okay, I guess that makes sense. So wherever possible, get an enthusiastic yes from your clients. Um, okay, let's go on to the next section. Okay, so on the next sections, um, six, seven, and eight, we've got a few areas here in the GOG, which will really give you some good information. And I do see this as about, it's about setting expectations. So it's the questions like, when do we review? And I'm a big believer there is not a one size fits all approach. It will depend on factors such as, are there exclusions that are gonna be reviewable in a few years? Um, is there a child who's presently too young to get child cover? Um, is it possible that you had a client on parental leave who was not able to get income protection at the time and they are going to be back at work? Are there changes in circumstances? Is the client aging and there are significant price increases happening year to year? Or what is the general rate of change that's happening in their life? As long as you set your expectations with the client about when to review, that's the important thing. Um, as far as record keeping goes, um, we all know that we have to keep records relating to the advice, the research, the interactions, clients and third parties. The guide does go into some uh, good in-depth examples of the sort of records that you may want to uh, keep. Uh, my approach to this scenario is ever since uh, COVID has happened, I now record all of my meetings on Zoom. Uh, even on the few meetings I've had face-to-face -face with clients, I still drag over my laptop and I record the whole lot. Um, and then I send a copy of that recording to the clients. So once again, it's making sure that clients are feeling informed, they can revisit your conversations. And of course, having that recording is um, gonna be better than any file note because there's nothing that's going to miss. Um, and of course, there's the aspect of how you store your records. That's really important as well. And the guide does address this. Um, you know, is this, have you got the right software in place to security? Do you keep backups on an external hard drive? Are you keeping it in the cloud plus your, um, plus your CRM that you use? All of these things need to be addressed. And the last section, of course, is just your conflicts of interest. Um, I'll just point out it's worth having a look at that in the guide. Um, but, you know, I've whizzed through all of that, but that is... Oh, yes, I can see a question popping up. I'm just going to answer this straight away, which is a privacy issue with recording the client in a Zoom meetings. Um, yes, with yes, there can be. If a client does not consent, that would be an issue. Um, the way I have addressed this with my clients is the first thing I do is I 
um, I have it setting in Zoom, which actually requires the client to agree to that before they can enter the their meeting room. So they do need to agree. And when they come into the meeting room, I explain why the meeting is being recorded. I tell them it's twofold. It's one, it means that I don't need to write the file note afterwards, which means I have more time with them. And the second reason is because I'm going to send them a copy of the meeting. So if they lost track, they got distracted, um, if there's somebody else they would like to share it with, or they simply want to revisit parts of the conversation, they can do that. Um, and I would probably say about half of my clients download the meetings. The other half uh, aren't interested. And sometimes people will come back later if they really want to revisit if um, for, there was a delay in the process for whatever reason, which saves my time and allows them to feel confidence they haven't missed anything either. Um, so I guess that's the... Uh, all the, all the uh, points I have for now. Um, ben, are there any other additional questions that um, people have? Hi, Catherine, yes. Uh, just two quick ones. Um, the first one is how many appointments do you have with new clients before recommendations made? Um, I.e. statement of advice and forms presented and signed. Seems to be three. Correct. So we have... Uh, uh, initial meeting and the client has to do some pre-work before they come in. If the pre-work isn't done within 24 hours of the meeting, the meeting is postponed. Um, then there is a strategy meeting, which takes into account all of the research we've done on what they have in place, allows us to get the third party authorities to research the covers inside their super funds. Um, and then typically um, following that strategy paper, um, we have the advice being implemented. And because the advice at the point it's not new to the client. They understand what it's broadly going to cost them and the concept. It's really about who is the insurer, what are the specific features, and, of course, everything else that has to go into SOA. So clients are typically saying, this is what I expected, this is what I wanted, can we please sign up today? So, um, so it's a three-meeting process for us. And then, of course, all the admin that follows the lodgement of the applications. Very good. And then secondly, um, there's a couple of questions here on how you've approached changes to level premiums um, and the massive increases we've been seeing the last couple of years yeah, in terms of those. Absolutely. So it really comes down to me for the time frame of the client and, um, and educating them. One of the things we do is I explain to them, I said, the level premium is not like a home loan interest rate. It is not a fixed premium. And I use the example of my own cover. And I said, I have had some of my covers on level premiums for 15 plus years now. And I said, over that time, on average, I see rate reviews every two to three years. Um, they can go up, they can go down. But the, the policy that I say I took out when I was 24, I still pay the rates for a 24 year old. Plus, as my cover has increased, I've paid more. So they understand it is not a set price, it can be altered. So that's really important to um, appreciate. And I, uh, and, in the lead up to 1 October, I haven't typically used um, level premiums on income protection for some time, but I do tell clients overall we are seeing trends going up because that's the state of the market. So they, it's about setting the expectation. Yep. Very good. We might leave it leave it there. There's a, there's a few more that we can ask broadly at the end, but thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so Catherine went through uh, uh, you know, a case study in respect to a mum and dad style of client and, um, and what she went through there is um, an excellent example of how you could build a strategy and advice process for that sort of client. Um, our business at Personal Risk Professionals, um, most of our clients are business owners, execs or professionals. So half of the work that we do um, is dealing in the business insurance space. Obviously, the common denominator with all business clients is they they have a family and so inevitably there will be personal advice at that family level to be given but what I would want to go through now is just the consideration of what it looks like to give uh, advice to a business so um, business insurance advice or what uh, sometimes called business succession planning is really trying to do three main jobs um, is protect the assets of the business. So most businesses will have some form of debt involved in that business, um, be it external debt to a bank uh, where there might be personal guarantees attached or debts owing to or from the proprietors themselves, which become a, a, uh, an, an asset of the, the, of the estate or the business 
upon the death of one of the owners. Um, the next is protecting the revenue of the business. So if we lost someone key in the business, what is the financial impact on that business? And then finally, protecting the ownership um, of the business. So me as a business owner, if I pass away, how does my family get um, their value out of the business to provide um, for the family? So when I'm dealing with a business client, I'm trying to address the business asset first rather than their personal circumstances because apart from their home or super, their business might end up being the, uh, you know, the biggest asset they hold. So making sure that that amount of money gets to the right people at the right time um, is important to make sure that that business owners exit out of both sides of the balance sheet of the business, both the asset and liability side. And then we can assess, well, what are the residual personal needs that those advisors might, uh, those clients might have? So next slide, please, Phil. Um, but then this, this uh, mud map really then is trying to show you what the breadth of business insurance advice is about. And I think the key thing here is it's not all about insurance. Um, typically, as an insurance advisor, that is where you're generally bought into the meeting, but there's a few things that need to be considered outside of that. So at the end of the day, drafting a business succession plan um, is really creating a deal or a plan between the owners to say if certain insurable events happen or non-insured events happen, what sort of things do we need to consider um, in terms of our exit and the impact on the business? So obviously, if the event is insurable in the event of death or TBD or trauma, um, then that creates a pool of funding to do the range of jobs that need to be considered at the bottom. So the sale price might be, okay, in the event of my death, um, how do I extract the value of my business if my share is a million dollars? Um, not only do I have an asset there in, in terms of the, the goodwill, for example, of the business, um, there is also debt that's sitting in that business that is held with a personal guarantee back against me. So um, how do we make sure that those personal guarantees can be removed? So when my family, my family um, receives the value of my business, it's not still a threat because of an external creditor. Repaying loan accounts back to um, either my estate or my estate back to the business need to be considered um, as they're also uh, things that sit on the balance sheet that need to be dealt with. Um, and so if you've dealt with those three issues properly, you then exited out a person from the business from both the asset and liability side of the balance sheet. Um, the next question then becomes, well, what's the impact on the business for those left behind if uh, one of the proprietors have gone? So that might be a loss of revenue that needs to be protected um, because that person might have held some key um, relationships or there might be a significant increase in cost to replace that person. Um, if the value of the business is linked back to the, to the ongoing income that that person generates, then the business might be worth less without one of those key people in it. So how do we compensate the business for that? So if we can go through and, and deal with each of those issues, then similar to Catherine's example where you're itemising out um, what's the impact of each of those things, then we can have a discussion with each of the individual families of that business to say, well, if we exit you out of this business properly, how much cover do you need at a personal level um, should something happen? But I think the thing to keep in mind is insurance isn't always the answer because um, if you add up the totality of all of these items, um, sometimes you aren't able to get the level of cover required if you're capping out at $5 million of ONOC TPD, for example, or $2 million of trauma, um, or the cover could be prohibitively expensive for the business. So there needs to be some consideration around what happens if you aren't insurable um, or are unable to afford that cover. Um, so the agreement that sits alongside any of this insurance becomes important to deal with. If there's no insurance showing up, what can we expect will happen out the other side? Is there a vendor finance clause? Does it go to market with the first option to purchase? Those sorts of things. Um, and then you might want to also consider, well, what other events that might not fall into um, the more catastrophic things uh, might be around retirement or the decision just to simply exit the business. So how does that plan 
work out over time. Next slide, Phil. Um, like Catherine noted in hers, the, the scope of engagement becomes really important when you're dealing with a business insurance client because you need to decide what role you're playing when you're giving advice in this area. So the diagram on the left really talks about the four key parties that need to be involved, I think, when giving advice in a business succession arena. Um, obviously, you've got your life insurance advisor who's going to give advice on the levels of cover and all that sort of stuff that needs to be put in place. You'll need to, you'll need to liaise with the accountant of the business to understand business values, um, cost base, um, you know, profit, lot, profit loss, ongoing revenue of the business, those sorts of things. And you'll need to engage with a lawyer um, to draft the, the associated business succession or buy-sell agreement that will bind all this insurance together to, to do the jobs that need to be done. Um, so sitting in the middle of that needs to be a facilitator to pull all those parties together. And you need to be really clear as who's doing that facilitation role. Um, because as an advisor, if you're experienced in pulling these parties together, that might be a role that you decide to take on and you charge for your services to do that. Um, otherwise, it might be the role of the accountant, it might be the role of the lawyer or the role of the client themselves, but it's really important to delineate who's responsible for getting that stuff done. Um, and all that's then defined in a letter of engagement. I think the last thing then also is really to be clear about who is the client in this situation because you really have sort of three layers to uh, a business client. You've got the business themselves, um, you've got the individual proprietors of those businesses and then the underlying families. Um, so in your engagement, you need to be clear about what level and who are you putting that advice to? Is it simply just the, um, you know, the proprietors, the business to do a buy-sell transaction and that's it is it key person cover is it debt reduction cover or are you covering off everything and then the residual um the residual needs of the family next one phil so once you've got a handle on i suppose the job that needs to be done and who's doing it um your role as the advisor is to get the right data to to make the right advice um, so when you're dealing with a business um, the first thing is to understand the ownership structure of the business. So what is being bought and sold in the event of someone's death or incapacity and exit from the business? And how is that asset being valued? Is that something that uh, has been valued by a formal valuation from their accountant or is it a valuation that's been uh, derived between the partners that they're satisfied with? And does that valuation methodology stack up because at the end of the day, we need to get that through underwriting? And so if we can't substantiate how that valuation was arrived at, uh, we might not be able to get the cover that needs to be um, put in place. Obviously then, if we already own a business, um, we've got a cost base to that asset. So we need to provide some indication to the client what is gonna be the tax implication potentially in the event of the transfer of their ownership upon their death or disablement. So that they as a family know that they might be getting a million dollar sum insured but if there's a uh, capital gains tax bill to go along with that, that will come out of those proceeds or they might elect to insure that. So the amount they get will, is uh, after any tax has been paid. Obviously, then we need to understand the external de debt structures of the business. So you know, who are the lenders that need to be repaid? Um, what are the security mechanisms that are in place with those? Uh, what are the default mechanisms if there is a death of a proprietor? Uh, are there any covenants with respect to the debt um, that need to be met uh, as, as part of their lending with their financier? From an internal de debt structure, um, that's really having a handle on what loan accounts sit on the balance sheet between the proprietors and, and the business and making sure that in the event of someone passing away or becoming incapacitated, what is the repayment mechanism for those? Um, a lot of the work then we do is around scenario testing the key person risk for a business. So really talking through, okay, if we lost Fred um, and he holds these key relationships with these clients, what is the potential impact to the business? And 
sort of role playing some of that out and, and putting some numbers to that. Um, so that, that's all about quantifying the level of risk that's sitting on the table. Uh, the last part then is looking at what existing agreements are in place that may or may not deal with the succession planning of the business. Usually the most common one obviously is a shareholders agreement or a proprietors agreement that talks about, I suppose, the rules between the partners about how they operate. Um, that may have some, uh, some clauses in it with respect to succession planning. Most often it's generally a first option to purchase um, and a buy-sell agreement would need to be done alongside of that. Uh, the next, Phil, thank you. Um, so in simple terms, I suppose this is the, the process we go through in terms of building the advice. Um, and what we start with is, you know, what needs to be covered. So if we go through each of those scenarios we talked about in the previous slides, we come up with the breadth of issues that need to be dealt with. The second thing is then, okay, well, what events need to be covered off? Is it just death? Is it permanent incapacity? What's the impact of a proprietor suffering a major medical trauma and what events do we want to be covered off for those? Um, once we've then got a handle on the, the needs and the types of cover, well, what are the implications of the ownership of the insurance to get the proceeds to the appropriate entity? You know, if I hold my interest in my business through a family trust and I have cell phone insurance, um, how do we get those proceeds into the family trust, which is the entity that's going to incur the tax liability? Um, then what are the impacts for the premiums and the benefits paid depending on the structure of insurance? Yeah, for example, TPD or trauma insurance held by a company for the purpose of debt reduction um, will have a capital gains tax bill attached to it. So how do we deal with that? Um, what underwriting limits are going to impact our product selection? And then what are the timeframes of the insurance needed? So again, um, sitting in with stepped and level premiums, as Catherine talked about before, really comes down to what's the longevity risk for the business. If you've got two young business partners in their 30s or early 40s who don't plan to be exiting for 15 or 20 years, level premium in those circumstances might be, might be important. Um, next one, Phil. Um, in, the, in, in the garden as, as our role of advisors, we need to consider what things outside of uh, the advice we're giving are gonna be impacted by what we're doing. So um, there really needs to be some consideration about what other documentation is required to support the advice we're giving. Um, so obviously I've touched on uh, you know, succession agreements or buy-sell agreements, uh, debt reduction agreements might be another in terms of dealing with um, uh, with external financiers, you know, if the businesses don't have an existing proprietors or shareholders agreement, um, the business is equally as exposed, I suppose, from a dummy spit between the, the two, between the business owners, which could end in, you know, significant loss um, if they don't have those in place. Um, key person minutes, if you're putting in place, uh, key person cover documenting the purpose and setting up the tax deductibility or the taxable nature of the, the benefits at the time of claim. And then the underlying estate planning requirements of the proprietors, so their wills and powers of attorney. Um, again, this come, who's going to draft those comes back to the engagement point in the first place. Um, so is it our role to facilitate that if we're playing that, or is that being handed over to the client or someone else to get those put in place? And I was talked about uninsured events earlier. Next one, Phil. Um, the needs of a business change dramatically over time. Um, so regular review is really important. We typically offer an annual review to every one of our business clients. Um, sometimes they come a bit more frequently than that, depending on changes that occur in the business. Um, you know, as the value of the business grows, that's arguably a dollar less of personal insurance they need as debts repaid in the business, asset value goes up. So making sure we've got a handle on the current circumstance of the business becomes really important. Obviously, we place a huge amount of value in our claims management proposition. You know, in our firm, we've managed close to $40 million of claim. Um, and obviously, when you've got a business partner, you've got multiple parties who are uh, uh, really relying on those proceeds coming out in a timely fashion. 
either to pay out um, you know, a grieving family or to keep a business running. Um, and as I said earlier, once we've dealt with all the needs of the business, we need to ask ourselves, well, what are the ongoing needs of the business owners' families? Um, if we've dealt with the business properly, does that make them potentially overinsured at home? Or what other things could happen at home that might impact the business, such as the death or disability of a spouse? Um, just conscious of time, because we're getting very close. Ben, was there any Q&A that we needed to cover off from that section? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, there was just a clarification question. Are you using a fee-for-service type model or commissions um, in the business insurance uh, space? I, I'm, I'm a very pro-commission uh, practice. Uh, that's not to say we don't charge fees. So we do charge fees for the facilitation work that we do. We do charge fees uh, for preparations of statements of advice um, because especially when you're dealing with business clients, there is a substantial amount of complexity that comes with that. Um, and then we, we will use commission as our form of remuneration for implementation and ongoing review work. So from a commission point of view, I view commission very much like insurance. It's the pooling of assets by the greater good for the unknown unfortunate, and it works the same from a commission point of view. Um, we don't know which of our clients are going to claim, um, so we need to basically have you know, an ongoing revenue stream coming in so the doors are open, the lights are on for us to, uh, to act on behalf of our client when they need us most. Okay. Um, and... Um... Catherine, you were mentioning that you record meetings. Um, does your licensee approve you recording meetings? Uh, I think my licensee is attending online. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, I don't think I, I would say that I haven't said it's been disallowed, but, you know, I've had my files audited with recordings and that hasn't been an issue. I think it really comes down to what the client has to be able to agree to it and it has to be stored securely. Okay, and uh, just to add to that, um, FPA members, there's a file note guide that the FPA put out this year, which talks about recording meetings. And uh, we've got a secret SOA project coming out later this year, which will have something to do, sorry, early next year, which will have something to do with that as well. So watch this space. Um, Phil, there's probably a question for you and I here. Um, is the FPA and AFA doing anything to get LIF scrapped? And I'm happy to respond to that. And I know that this is a, is a hot issue for many risk advisors. The, the practical reality though is we got to deal with this in stages. I, I don't think LIF is ever going to be scrapped because I don't think the government's going to go back on, on what they've done. Is there an opportunity to increase the, the cap in the first year is probably more the genuine question. But right now, our, our focus has to be to get through the LIF review, which will which has now been built into the quality of advice review next year to ensure that we avoid any further reduction. So that's the first target. We get through that and then we're in a position um, and maybe off the back of that to say, what does it need to be to ensure that everyday Australians can get access to life insurance advice? Which is a great segue, Phil, into this slide that we've got up on the screen here. So the FPA and AFA have jointly uh, created the Life Risk Advice Guide. And Mark, um, Mark was involved heavily in the first edition of uh, creating the guide and Catherine uh, and, and Brett from the AFA side, Mark, um, and um, Andrew Proudfoot have been very involved in creating this updated version. Um, what the guide does is basically sets out the advice process that Mark and Catherine have been going through um, and explains how each of those helps you meet the the uh, FASIA code, um, the TPB code as it was, your Corporations Act obligations. Um, there's references into the FPA code and the AFA code into there as well. Um, so the guide basically is a step-by-step -step guide in providing best practice advice uh, when you're providing life risk advice to your, your clients. 
Um, FPA members, you can get that on the FPA member portal in the resources section and AFA members, it was emailed out to you as part of the invitation to this webinar and will be emailed out again um, after the webinar. Um, just conscious of time, um, we have a few more questions which we haven't had time to get to. So we're going to take those questions down and we'll try and get you and well, we will get you answers back again uh, via a variety of channels. Um, but thank you for attending today's webinar. The recordings, presentation slides will be uploaded um, on the AFA's website and in FPA's Learn portal. Um, all registrants will receive an email confirming when that's available and CPD certificates will be sent out as part of that process as well. But if you've got any questions, if you need, if you want more info, if you want access to the guide, if you want access to the presentation, um, for AFA members, send an email to info at afa.asn.au and for FPA members, send an email to cpd at fpa.com.au. But I would like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank Mark for his long time effort on the life insurance task force and and all, everything he's done with for the FPA and with members around life insurance and good luck in with the business in the future, Mark. And thank you, Catherine, for all your efforts um, in the task force as well and, and putting together the guide and presenting to all of us today. Um, and thank you, Phil, for being my colleague in in advocacy. And uh, it you know um, the feedback we're getting through here is that everybody seems to have enjoyed the two associations coming together to do this webinar so we'll look for a lot more opportunities to do this going forwards over next year so thank you everyone have a great day and uh, we will see you next year